Good evening, my name is Angel Vargas. I'm a 34-year-old young man. I know I've been blessed with young genes, but I am 34, I promise. I can show you my license if you want to know way out. It is my age. I was told that I had five to seven minutes to speak to you folks, but the problem is that my daddy's a pastor. So those of you that have been to church know that pastors warm up with five to seven minutes. But we're going to try to make this happen. So who am I, right? I'm sure you guys know Steve. A lot of you know uh, Pastor Phil. Some of you know Dawn. Some of you know myself, but some of you don't. So my job is to just tell you a little bit about myself. So first and foremost, I am the loving and most importantly committed husband of one Maciel Vargas. So I'm going to ask to just stand up. That's right. <laughs> We've been together for about 13 years, been married for almost six years, and um, one, of the most, one of the most precious blessings is that God has blessed us with the opportunity of having two adorable babies, one that is sitting on my mother's lap, that's Sarah, and the other one who's sitting on my wife's lap, who's Sophia. And um, I said that I think that if people don't remember me, I think my daughter can win me an election. <laughs> if I just carry her around, people won't remember me, but they'll pull the ballot for Sarah and we'll be all right, however I can get my votes. I'm also the son of a pastor, like I said before, not only the, the senior pastor at People Bible Center, but also the founding pastors at People Bible Center. And why is that important? Because from a young age, Two things, or a lot of things were non-negotiable in my house, but two things especially stick out. The first one is that on Sunday morning, no matter what happens, no matter who's playing, there is one place that I am allowed to be, or I've always been allowed to be. Where is it? Church. Non-negotiable. Everyone was in church on Sunday. But the second is probably as equally important, or not more, if not more important, and it's that my father was a blue-collar person who God brought from a difficult situation and brought him to pastor a church that today has about seven to 800 members, one of the largest churches in our community. And one thing that he instilled in me from a young age is that he always had an expression, and I'll say it in Spanish and I'll try to translate it in English, and it was that, el que no vive para servir, no sirve para vivir. And the translation of that, as best I could put it, is he who does not live to serve does life no service. And from a young age, it was non-negotiable. If somebody needed help, we had to help. If somebody needed somebody to paint a house at five, six, seven years, I didn't know what I was doing, but I, was, I had a paintbrush in my hand and I was painting somebody's house. Because from a young age, when you tie both things together, I am a religious person, I don't make no exceptions about it. And what I like about the slate is that everybody on this slate is faith-based. We understood that we were not placed on this earth to be about I. It was always to be about you and someone else, and how could we bless somebody else? So from a young age, dad pulled us out of, out of the home, brought us to church. If it was feeding the, 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 the hungry or, 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 or the homeless, or it was doing whatever we had to do to help others, we had a responsibility to help others. Today, fast forward, when I speak to Judge and Judge calls me and says, hey, Angel, I need, you, I need you to run with me. You're the guy I need to run with me. Why am I running? Well, the first reason I'm running is probably the reason why I almost said no to the judge, which is that, to me, one of the most important things that I've seen in my family and I, I've kept in my own, for my parents my own, is that family is important. And family, in my belief, is the backbone of our society. And when I was asked to run, I am a 34-year-old young man, but I am very heavily involved. I have a full-time job. I'm a full-time husband, which is a great job, by the way. Great overtime, right? But I'm, I'm a full-time husband. I am a full-time now dad of two girls, one, two, and one six months old. I am heavily involved in my church. We, my wife and I lead about 100 youth and young adults in our church. 
And on top of that, I'm also a, a, an assistant pastor to a second service that is, that is up and coming in our church, an English-speaking service. So one thing I knew that I was going to set time aside for my family no matter what I did in life. So when the judge said, I, I'm going to need some of your time, we're going to, and I, I started thinking campaign. I'm not a politician, but I like politics, so I understand. I see politicians who run campaigns, and, and they have to invest a lot of time. And I, I, I almost, I, I went home, and I said, judge, I'm going to pray about it, and I'm going to speak to my wife about it. Because happy wife, happy, I see a lot of people are married here. You guys know what I'm saying. <laughs> So I was not going to dare make a decision until I spoke to my wife because we had to be in one spirit. And the judge, he's great at persuading. He's like, listen, if you want, I'll bring my wife over. We'll have... And I'm like, judge, this is not a group thing. I, I got to sleep next to her. You guys leave. I stay home. So I came home and I, and, I, and I brought it to my wife's attention and she thought about it. And I thought she was going to say, absolutely not. What are you thinking about? Times are crazy right now. And instead, what she told me was, I think this may be what you need to do. And the reason why, as we begin to speak, is that I told you what's important to me is family. And the first reason why I'm running is because I look at Freeport today. And this is not negative. This is just pointing what we want to accomplish. But I look at Freeport today, and I'm not sure that it's the Freeport that I want to leave my daughters. Because at some point here, we have some challenges that are evident to this slate, and hopefully we'll be sharing with you guys um, as time passes. But there are some financial challenges where if we don't address them at some point, taxes are going to skyrocket in this village. I love this village. I was born in this village. I was raised in this village. I don't only live in this village. I don't have a physical address that says free, but I live in this village. My wife lives in this village. My father, my mother lives in this village. My siblings all live in this village. I worship in this village. I purchase um, services in this village. So I am Freeport. So for me to say I want to leave Freeport or to think that in the future my, my daughters may not want to live in Freeport, to me that is moving. That is my impetus, my first impetus for running are my children. I want my children one day to wait to, to grow up and see the Freeport that we have envisioned and, and watch it come to fruition and say, my daddy was part of that. Steve was part of that. Pastor Phil was part of that. Dawn was part of that. They built that. And not only are we going to build it, we're going to build it with your help. Because every one of you in this room, we're not asking for your votes. We're asking for your partnership. Because you can go and you can pull a ballot on March 21st and go home, and that's not going to be good enough. Because we're going to need you the next four years, the next eight, the next 12, the next 16 years. We're going to need you to partner with us to make Freeport what you want it to be for your children, what you want it to be for yourselves. So I am running for Sarah. I'm running for Sophia. Second reason I'm running, diversity. So one of the great things about Freeport, I believe, is that it's so diverse and such rich in diversity. So rich in diversity, right? You walk out, see people of all kinds of races and ethnicities. See, I want my daughters to be raised in a village where not everyone looks like them, not everyone praises the way they do. I, I, want them, I, don't, want to, I don't want to show to them. I want them to see diversity. But one of the problems is that in our village, the same thing that makes us strong right now is making us weak. And it's division in our, in our village. And it's not only amongst racial lines. You have a group of folks that rule for a period of time of four, five, 12 years. And they, get re and they rule for a certain group of folks. They govern for a group, certain group of folks. They then are, they lose an election. Another group comes in. And that new group governs for another group of folks and forgets about the ones that just lost. Well, here is the question that I pose to you. What if one group of folks was to come in, win an election, and govern for everyone? Independent of your race, 
your ethnicity? Are you a Democrat? Are you a Republican? Are you Catholic? Are you Christian? Just one group of folks that say everyone is going to play by the same set of rules. Isn't that how you begin to unify a village? No favoritism. Everyone plays by the same set of rules. I believe that's, how, that's where we start. And I believe the right people to do that is Judge Drummings, is Phil Ramos, I'm sorry, not Phil Ramos, Pastor Phil, is Dawn Warren, and it's Angel Vargas. I want to bring unity back into our village. You know, one, one issue that's close to heart, as I said, my father's a pastor. The current administration, and I'm, uh, this is not mudslinging, it's something that I've witnessed personally, and that's why it's dear to heart. They understand that we have a tax problem. They do. But I don't believe that they can come up with creative ideas to start generating revenue. I am an accountant by trade, so I understand that if your expenses are here, your revenue has to be higher than that, or if not, you're going to start falling into deficit. I think anybody, that's commonsensical, right? And when they came in, they said, you know what? We're going to raise revenues, and one of the ways that we're going to do it is we're going to challenge the tax exemption of the ministers in our community. Now, I believe that you show me a village that is successful, a state that is successful, a country that's successful, and I will show you ministers that are standing behind the political figures, praying with them hand in hand and leading them. So when we start attacking our, our pastors and start challenging tax exemption to get a couple of dollars so that we can start covering some of the deficit, that hits home to me. Because I don't believe that anybody should be singled out because they're Christian or they're not Catholic. or what. Everyone should play by the same set of rules. Number three, and my last one. Quality of life. How many free porters do we have? Can I see? Beautiful. The taxes, the property taxes in the village are too high. Yes? So there's two types of politicians, right? The ones that come in here and sell you the world and can't deliver, and the ones that tell you the truth. I won't be selling you the world. I can only tell you the truth. And the reality is that Reducing taxes in the village is not going to be something that's going to be done overnight. It's not an easy feat. It's not. But the reality is that it can be done. And what's great about this, this slate is that when I met with, with, with Stephen, I, he says I interrogated him, but I, all I did was meet with him a couple of times. And I asked him, I said, you know, Steve, I'm not really, you know, I'm not gravitating towards running, but I want to hear what you have to say. Because I wanted to understand the character. We talked character, competence, commitment. I wanted to understand the character of the man. And I said, if I run with you, I am not in the business of running to just sling mud. Because that's not how I want to run. I want to run a campaign that is merit-based, that has ideas, where we can tell people, these are your issues, yes, but this is how we're going to fix it. So when you go into a Best Buy and you're looking at a TV, my father, who couldn't be here today because he's out of the country, had a bride commitment, he was just shopping for TVs the other day, and he goes into Best Buy. He says, Angel, come with me. Come take a look at these TVs. I need your exp expertise. So I'm thinking he's going to walk in, and he's going to get, you know, the best $2,000, $3,000 TV. And, but my father's a pastor, so he understands the value of a dollar, which means that he's kind of frugal. <laughs> And he, he gets something that's very modest. You know, I think it was like a thousand something dollars. And, and I said, Dad, I would get this that's, you know, two grand because it has this and a third. And he may feel that the TV that he's buying for a thousand dollars is providing a return on his investment. He's getting his money's worth, right? I may feel that I'm willing to pay a little more as long as I'm getting a return on my investment for my two or three thousand dollar TV. There are TVs at, at, at Best Buy that are $7,000. I could never fathom paying that, but the person that pays it pays it because they understand they're getting a return on their investments. 
So when we look at our tax situations, why am I talking to you about TVs, right? Because it's the same principle. When we pay taxes, there's one or two things that we can do. We can either help you lower your taxes, which we, we hope that's our long-term plan. But in the meantime, as you're paying taxes, we hope to hold the line. But we hope to provide you quality of life where you feel that you're getting your money's return. You're getting a return on your investment. Yes, you're paying high taxes, but you know what? Your roads aren't only fixed around election time. Your roads are fixed every year or every week you have a road fixed in your village. Or your parks are given the attention that they need. You know, as a father, I now go to parks. I take my daughters to parks and I, I see so many improvement opportunities. But those, that's where my money is. If I'm paying taxes, I want my parks to reflect it. I want my roads to reflect it. I want Pastor Phil talked about sewers. I want, I want to make sure that my sewers are, are strong, that when, when the tide comes up, my house isn't flooded. My father lives on the south side of Freeport. I live on the north side of Freeport. I've lived on the south side. So I understand that there's even a division between the south and the north. Some people say that they're two different towns, but they're one town. We're all Freeport. So when the tide goes up in my, on my father's side of the town, his backyard floods, the streets flood. He's thought about moving to the north side again just because he's like, every time it floods, my basement floods, everything in my basement floods. So why am I bringing this to you? Because I'm saying that we understand that you guys pay a lot of taxes. But what we're looking to do is make sure that while you're paying it, while we're trying to bring it down, you guys can feel like you're getting a return on your investment. Like you're getting adequate. My barber is in Freeport. I sat in his chair and he told me, you know what, Angel? I moved out of Freeport. And I said, why did you move out of Freeport, Felix? He said, I moved out of Freeport because we pay high taxes. I said, I understand that. He said, but why should I have anything to envy Merrick or a Rockville Center or a Belmore? I pay just as much taxes at them, if not more taxes, but when I drive down the street, it does not reflect the taxes that I pay. He ended up moving out of Freeport. And as I say in one of our videos, I am hoping that when we are done, when we win, because we will win, right? That's right. When we win, another thing I told Stephen, I don't want to be a one-term team. I want to make sure that year after year we're brought back because people see that it's not about lining our pockets. It's not about the connections that we can make that will benefit us financially. We are there to serve people and just help people. Our heart is devoted to people. I want to help you not because it helps benefit me, but because perhaps it benefits my daughter's future generation. Perhaps it benefits your children. Perhaps it benefits you, it benefits your churches. What if our, our, our village started partnering with our churches again? What would happen to our village? Pastors know, those of you that go to, those church folks know, when a church comes outside of the four walls, they can be such an asset. But for the past four years, I don't feel that they have because they have not felt welcome. So I'm running for quality of life in Freeport. And I don't want to make empty promises to you, but the one promise I will make is that I will work tirelessly and I will work hard with this team to ensure that your tomorrow is better than your today. The most important thing I could do is make your tomorrow better than your today. And I'm sure that there might be somebody here who might have been sent by the opposition. I'm sure. And to you, I say this. I say when we win, my promise to you is that I will not make, we will not make your lives difficult. We will make your lives better. Because as Stephen always says, we're not only going to govern the people who voted for us, we're going to govern for the people that did not vote for us as well. We're hoping to win their support by our actions. It may not take, you know, it may not be overnight. But well, we hope to win it. And I'll end with this. I was once told that every time you meet somebody in life, they will fall into one of four categories. 25% of the people that you meet don't like you and will never like you. 
Another 25% of the people you meet won't like you, but can be persuaded to like you. Another 25% of the people like you, but can be persuaded not to like you. And then the last 25% like you, and no matter what anybody tells them, they're going to like you. We're going to govern for the top 75% and we're going to make them like us by the end of our four years because we're going to do the best job that we can do. Why? Because we're four people who have a basis of competence, commitment, and character. <laughs> Take note. All four candidates are married. Their spouses live with them in Freeport. Their children live with them in Freeport. Their devoted husbands, devoted wives. Why is that important? Because we talk about competence, commitment, character. Well, to be married for as long as some of these folks have been married, it takes some commitment, doesn't it? Anybody married can attest to commitment? Can I get an amen? amen. Uh, that's right, we in church now. <laughs> but. Commitment can't be commitment without another C, can it? You need to have character in order to be committed. When storms come your way, you need to stare in the eye of the storm and say, I'm not moving, I'm still standing. I'm standing right here alongside my partner, alongside my investment, and I'm not moving. I have the character to withstand a storm. These four folks are proven, competent their own law firms, a pastor over 20 years, a young adult that has an accounting background who worked for a big four accounting firm who understands finances, who wants to bring that to the village to help reduce those taxes, reduce our expenses. Folks that have a commitment to make your free port better tomorrow, folks that have the competence to do it, and lastly, folks that are built on character. I thank you for your time. God bless you guys. Thank you. <laughs>